Hi guys, this is Mrs. Foy, and this is a quick little um, screencast about radioactivity as an introduction to the lab that you're going to do, the Half Life Pennies Lab. So, um, what is what is radioactivity, right? So, as it turns out, some atoms are more stable than others. Um, and we need to talk about nuclear stability. So protons repel other protons. And when you put protons together in a tiny nucleus, it's going to be very unstable because of the repulsion. The neutrons are neutral, and they kind of act like a glue to hold the protons together, and they kind of balance out that repulsion that the protons have against each other. But the problem is, is that when you have a one-to-one -one ratio of protons to neutrons, the nucleus stays pretty stable. But as you get higher than uh, element 83, um, and you, you get more neutrons than uh, protons in a, a ratio, they start to get, become unstable. So radioactivity um, is going to be, um, the energy that is emitted when you have an unstable nucleus begin to break apart. And those pieces um, that break apart of the atom are called uh, radiation. So there's three different types of radioactive decay. There's alpha decay, there's beta particle decay. An alpha particle is positive, a beta particle is negative, and gamma radiation is um, actually not a particle. It's kind of a um, it's kind of a a, 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 um, a wave of light, and it doesn't have a charge. But as we'll see, it is the most um, it's the it's the strongest. Okay, so alpha decay, let's take a look at this. So you have some, um, uh, an element here, plutonium, that is um, uh, unstable. And what happens is, is that it will give off a helium nucleus. So this is an alpha particle right here. And what happens is, is that it will then decay into another element that's actually, actually uranium-236. So in an alpha decay, you have a piece of this, this, this two protons and two neutrons that's a helium nucleus that breaks apart. In beta decay, you have a basically a, a high energy electron that comes off. And so uh, here we have a radium 228. We have a, a beta particle that comes off. So it doesn't have any mass, you can see up here, but it does have a charge of minus two. And then that decays into another element um, that has a mass number of 228 and a proton number of 89. And it's interesting, we're not going to balance radioactive, um, uh, radioactive uh, chemical reactions in this class, but you can see that the uh, mass number on the left and the right have to be equal, and uh, the, the proton number um, in the lower left-hand corner also has to be. So what actually happens in beta decay is a neutron changes into a proton and emits an electron. So that's what's happening in beta decay. In gamma radiation, as I said, it is not a particle. It's actually electromagnetic radiation. It's kind of a wave of energy that's given off either during alpha or beta decay. And so what happens is, is that um, a lot of times in some of these radioactive uh, decays, here I have uranium-238 that's being um, decayed into thorium, it gives off a, um, an alpha particle and also some gamma radiation. So a lot of times uh, we'll see gamma radiation as an additional type of radiation in decay. So what is the difference between alpha, beta, and gamma as far as humans are concerned? So an alpha particle is really big and heavy. You remember that the alpha particle is what uh, Rutherford did in his gold foil experiment. They're, they're pretty heavy as far as atomic particles concerned. And that alpha particle is not going to be able to penetrate your skin. It's too heavy. It's too big. If it actually gets inside of you, if you ingest it or inhale it, it can be very dangerous because they're big, but they just bounce off your skin. A beta particle can penetrate about an inch of your skin, so um, it's a little more uh, um, 
dangerous to us. And a gamma radiation is going to go all the way through your skin and your tissues and get into your organs. So what is nuclear fission? So nuclear fission is, fission means breaking apart. So when you have a larger unstable nucleus break into smaller pieces. So here's an example of uranium-235 that breaks into smaller pieces. So I've got krypton here and barium breaks into smaller pieces. So that's what fission is. And fission is part of a chain reaction. So it starts with a radioactive particle here, uranium-235, and a neutron that kind of starts this chain reaction. And so one um, initiates the decay of another and another and another. And so you have this huge release of energy, and humans use that to do some pretty cool things and some not so cool things. One of the great things that we use with, um, radio, with fission reactions is the energy that's given off we can use to produce steam. And that steam, as you know, can be used to turn a turbine, which creates electricity in a generator. And the heat that comes, uh, that is required to boil this water and make steam, comes from a radioactive reaction, um, nuclear fission. And the good thing about that is, is that it doesn't require any fossil fuels. So it doesn't burn any uh, fossil fuels. It doesn't create any air pollution. It creates no carbon dioxide, and it creates a lot of electricity. And where we live in York, Pennsylvania, um, we used to have two nuclear reactors. We had Three Mile Island and Peach Bottom, and now Three Mile Island has been retired. But we do have Peach Bottom that produces a lot of our electricity. So one of the bad uses of nuclear fission is an atomic bomb, which is an uncontrolled fission reaction, okay? In a nuclear power plant, there's a controlled fission reaction, and that energy is used to uh, produce a lot of heat, which boils water, which produces a turbine, produces steam, which turns a turbine, which creates electricity. And so one little tiny uranium pellet can produce as much energy as 17,000 cubic feet of natural gas, you know, almost 2,000 pounds of coal or 149 gallons of oil. So it's a very, very uh, powerful reaction. Some advantages of nuclear reaction, it's very efficient. It doesn't pollute. There's no um, uh, NOx or SOx, which are air pollutants, and there's no carbon dioxide, which is very important with climate change. Um, it doesn't have enough uranium for an uncontrolled chain reaction, so it's not going to be like a bomb. It's never going to explode. But as we'll see that Due to human error, there can be accidents. But I just wanted to show you here that nuclear power can really help reduce um, our human carbon footprint and reduce problems with climate change because it produces zero carbon dioxide. And you really need to keep that in mind as we move towards renewable energy um, and move away from burning fossil fuels in your lifetime, nuclear power will probably play a role until we can get to some other uh, types of renewable energy like our solar and wind power and longer batteries that can help us um, be um, totally sustainable with our energy. The disadvantages of carbon, uh, of nuclear fission, is that um, the mining for uranium is dangerous and hazard, hazard, hazardous in itself. There's only so much of it there. We have leftover um, materials from nuclear fission that are still radioactive themselves, and we call those dirty. Um, we don't know what to do with the radioactive waste. Nobody wants, that, wants it buried in their backyard. Um, and so uh, we have to be very careful about monitoring where that waste goes. Um, and so uh, that's, those are all things that are are negative things of nuclear fission. And you're going to watch a video on Chernobyl, which Chernobyl was a, a, a nuclear reactor in uh, Russia that had the world's worst uh, nuclear um, accident due to human error. And um, it uh, was a very bad um, accident that left uh, many 
many, many square miles of uh, this area in Russia uh, uninhabitable for 20,000 years. Um, so you'll learn more about that. Um, the containment unit is where the fission reaction occurs, and that's supposed to keep the radiation in place. But as I said, because of human error, there was a, um, the reaction um, was uh, not properly maintained and actually caused a small explosion, not a nuclear uh, bomb or anything like that, but it was a small explosion that blew off the top of the reactor and emitted a lot of radiation that made a lot of people sick. And these are just some pictures. You'll learn more about this um, in the video that you uh, watch in our class. So the real key, um, as we can see in our Spider-Man flick here, is nuclear fusion. Nuclear fusion is where two nuclei come together to make a larger nucleus. And this is what our sun does. So um, it occurs in all of our stars and our suns. It's the main energy um, given off by stars. Nuclear fusion is um, how we make new elements. And this is the reaction that happens in all of our stars, that hydrogen is fused together to make helium. And that gives off a lot of energy and light and heat. And that's the energy that we see from our sun. And so what is this such a big deal about uh, nuclear fusion? Well, it produces a lot of energy and it would be much safer than fission because there's no radioactive byproducts. Um, it's, uh, there are accidents are less likely to happen and less dangerous. And the amount of fuel that is used is very small. So we really, really want to be able to uh, get to nuclear fusion. A hydrogen bomb is a weaponized version of nuclear fusion. And we're still trying to learn more about how to help our energy needs with, with nuclear fusion. Um, and so what happens is, is that in order to get these particles together, you have to get them going really, really fast and you have to have super, super high temperatures. And so it is very difficult to fuse nuclei together in a nuclear fusion reaction. But I have every faith that human ingenuity will get there. So, um, we, uh, because of these high temperatures, we have to try to figure out a way to control these reactions. We can use high powered lasers to get the temperature up. We also need very high pressures. And what we're using right now is we're using a magnetic field to try to contain the reaction. And so this is a, uh, a nuclear fusion um, reactor accelerator um, that is in, uh, that's in England. So right now we do uh, have, we have done nuclear fusion, but right now it uses more energy than it produces. But we're very hopeful that by the year 2050 that we will be able to master uh, nuclear fusion and that can uh, help us with our energy um, demands in the world that we have today along with solar, wind, geothermal, and of course hydrogen fuel cell energy. So remember that in all of these nuclear reactions, the law of cons conservation of matter and energy has to hold. So mass uh, during both fission and fusion, um, we have this mass that is converted into energy. And so uh, that is very important. And that is the basis of why we use these nuclear reactions as um, producing energy for us. So what is half-life? So half-life is the amount of time it takes for the amount of radioactive material to decrease by half. And we know that this, um, when, a, uh, when a radioactive particle decays into another particle, that it happens randomly, but it happens at a very regular interval. And so we call that interval a half-life. Some half-lives are very, very long, okay? So uranium-238 has a half-life of, uh, you know, 4 billion years. It's a very, very long half-life. So it takes a long time for half that material to decay. And you can see that some of these other um, big atoms, uh, radioactive atoms, have very long half-lights. But some have 
shorter half-lives. One of the ones that uh, we use a lot to try to uh, date with humans is we use a radioactive isotope of carbon called carbon-14. And carbon-14 goes through beta decay into the stable nitrogen-14. And so um, that we can use to date anything, any living thing that has carbon in it. So there are three isotopes of carbon. There's regular carbon-12 that's, that's stable. We have a rare form of carbon-13 that's not very much the carbon isotopes are carbon-13. And we all have radioactive carbon-14. So all of the molecules in our body and anything around us that is made of natural materials has some amount of carbon-14 in it. And so what happens is at death, of that organism, the radioactive carbon-14 begins to decay. And so we can say every half-life, um, which takes a half-life of carbon-14 is about uh, 5,700 years that half the material decays. So what we can do is we can measure the amount of radioactivity left in this saber-toothed tiger's bones. And then we, we know how slow carbon-14 decays and we can figure out how old it is. And that's really cool. That's called carbon-14 dating. And so what we do is we measure the amount of radioactivity that we have left in a sample. And then we can, we, we have a standard curve of the, uh, the length of time it takes to decay, and then we can figure out the number of half-lives or the number of years, and we figure out how old that thing is. So that's pretty cool. So what you guys are going to do today in this lab is we're going to simulate um, the decay of carbon-14 by uh, pretending that each atom of carbon-14 is a penny. And we're going to say that when you have a heads up, that means the carbon-14 atom has decayed into nitrogen. If you have tails, then we say the carbon-14 is not decayed. So you're going to shake, you're going to start with 100 pennies, you're going to shake your box of pennies, and you're going to remove all the heads. And then you're going to shake again and remove all the heads. And each time you're going to count the number of, of uh, coins with heads that you have removed, per shake, and then you're going to graph that data. So here's a quick little video. All right, everybody. So hopefully that's been helpful and you'll enjoy this activity and I'll see you in class.